Welcome into episode 288 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian D. Felice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. We have our opening shifts to get into following the Bruins' overtime win over the Montreal Canadiens. But first, there's a couple of items we have to hit right off the bat. Number one, I don't think any one of us are in great shape today. Uh, personally, it's because I am I ha- I'm going through the classic. Didn't get sick once throughout the winter, but now that the weather's getting warm, now I'm sick. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to call this my flu game. That's a bit dramatic, Brian. But um, so I have that going on on my end. Meanwhile, north of the border, Bridget and Scott, holy smokes, have I seen some pictures this past <laughs> days? And, um, why don't I throw it over to you two to talk to me and, and the listeners about your trip up north? It's It's been a very nice, relaxing, calm <laughs> couple days. No, um, it's not. It's no, the it's, first time I've been sitting in my hotel room, just not do it. Like we've been out, we've been, we've been around town. Yeah. It's, it's been great though. Like Montreal, great, great city. Uh, good crowd at the game last night. Even, even though it wasn't the most exciting game um, for most of it, which we'll get into. Um, but yeah, we met some cool people, went to some cool bars. Um, A couple beer towers, I, maybe. <laughs> yeah, one one beer tower, uh, which was I gotta say for two people was was a little aggressive, but we I thought we could have done two. I, I, I think just, that's extremely wishful thinking. I just <laughs> I just want to say I I may or may not have seen a picture of, of of Scott with his uh behind an empty beer tower with his 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 <laughs> his head just in his in his arms on the table. And listen, I don't I don't think anybody listening could could blame because um. Like you said, that's a, that's quite a lot for two people. But it wasn't just a Bruins Canadians trip. It's it's also Scott's birthday today. So little little round of applause. And there and there it is. And for, there it is. For the record, this was just for the photo. I was not actually past it. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was. He goes. Go oh, send this to Brian. Send this to Brian. Okay. Well, I'm glad you clarified that because. But if that was real, I I, I wouldn't have blamed you. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> no, because no, because then here he is at the next bar. Looking happy as hell, like he's just. Oh, he's, okay. That's he's right. wearing the birthday crown. That yeah, I with snuck my birthday in. crown. <laughs> he's wearing the birthday crown. I snuck in. He had no idea that I was about to be like, "Hey, here's your birthday crown." Um, and he wore it, and that's. I had to wait for him to get to the right level of buzzed for him to throw that on. Now, how was how was a drive? How was a drive up? Did you, did you two scratch and claw at each other? Like we we try to throw each other out the window. What happened? Scott, was that? I bad? I, I mean, I did leave her at, at Hill Farmstead. We stopped at the brewery, and you know, but but I felt bad. I got got a little ways down the road, and I was like, yeah, I guess I should probably take her. Was 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 Bridget practicing her her play by play with like street signs? And there's an exit sign, and there's, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a gas station right there on a off the right circle. I only made him listen to two Shakira songs, just two. That's not bad. Any no. Harry Styles? Yeah. Oh, a lot of Harry. Styles. There was lots of Harry Styles. But he doesn't what? mind Harry Styles, so. No, I do like Harry Styles. There's lots of Taylor Swift, which I also don't mind, so. Mm. A lot of Taylor Swift. Good poutine? Any poutine? Yes. Great poutine. Scott had breakfast poutine yesterday. Yeah. That was, a, that was an excellent choice. Well, you guys are still up there right now, so the trip's not completely over, so you can, you know, maybe do one, one or two more things before you head home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Get, get Scott drunk again, right? I don't think so. I think that's a, that's enough for a couple of days. All right. Well, Scott, as I mentioned, it is your birthday, so happy birthday! And because of that, we will we'll have you start off with the opening shifts today. How's that? Sure. So uh, I thought one of the more interesting storylines from this game was Andrew Peaks Bruins debut, uh, and I thought he played really well. I thought that was a very encouraging first step for him. Um, played just over seventeen minutes. Had a couple hits, a couple blocks. I thought there were some shifts where, you know, he did a good job defending the net front, which we've talked about is, you know, is going to be key. Like, it should be a strength of his game. The All the analytics would tell you in Columbus that it wasn't. So got to get that straightened out. But, um, yeah, first game, no, no issues. Like, really nothing to complain about. I thought he was uh, involved offensively a couple times, had a couple nice keep-ins. Um, you know, simple puck movement and transition, nothing flashy, obviously, which, you know, that's his game. Like it's, it's going to be simplified. Um, 
but yeah, Jim Montgomery had pretty high praise for him after the game. So good, good first step. And obviously it's, you know, there's only 14 games left in the regular season. So that's not a lot of time to get him up to speed in the Bruins system and figure out, you know, is he going to be an everyday player come the playoffs or is he a rotational depth piece? I think if he plays like last night, he's probably an everyday player, but you know, now let's see if he can keep that going moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I thought he, he looked very solid back there. Uh, we'll get into that more later. Uh, so my opening shift is it was Beecher's first game back. It was just over two months since he had played for the Bruins. He'd been down in Providence. Um, and so he's centering the fourth line last night and thought he did a good job. He did a great job on his face-offs, which is his strength and something that he can bring to the team. It's always funny when when you talk to the players and they, they're like, it almost sounds like sometimes they're, they're like, it's a thesis, like what they're, they're, they're trying to like give us an essay about like, okay, this is what I can bring. Like after the game uh, or no, before the game Beecher was, was talking about like, yeah, I can, I can do this. I can, I can bring the face offs. I, um, I can be physical. And he, and he was right. He did. He did that. Um, He played some key penalty killing minutes. He started, like he took a face off in overtime. He didn't win that one, but uh, he, they were using him in high leverage situa- situations because he, you know, they trust him defensively and uh, with his face off. So uh, I thought it was nice to see him back. I thought he played well. I think you know, we can discuss what maybe the optimal fourth line might be come playoff time. Uh, but uh, as of Montreal, it was a little bit of a boring game at different points. But uh, Beecher, I thought, was was a positive. Yeah, a lot to talk about there, and you, you're kind of learning that there there is some depth. Well, yeah, I guess we already knew that, but there is depth on this Bruins roster up front. Although all the time it was just kind of maybe a lack of that that one extra high end player. But speaking of potential high end players, so seven points in his last six games, overtime winner last night. So Jake DeBrusque, uh, the points are following him now, and just another reminder that again the history shows the, the analytics show that when Jake DeBrusque is scoring that the Bruins are highly successful and, and that's that's not going to be any different in the spring it's it's the biggest reason why all along in the beginning of the se- the first half plus of the season and even as recent as a month ago it's he's very polarizing when he's not scoring and when he's not scoring, you have a lot of people who are defending him and, and, and understandably so that the, the play is still there, but the points aren't there. And, but unfortunately for him, because of, because of where he is in this lineup and because of his ceiling, if the points aren't there, it's e- and, and the Bruins aren't winning. It's easy to look at him and say, that's a reason why, like he, he's capable of scoring at a high level. So when you're not, even when you're playing well, you're going to draw criticism. And I think his streakiness doesn't help him over the years. That said, he's integral to them when he's scoring. And this last week plus has been a reminder of that. And as we get closer to the playoffs, he's imperative, especially because he's still on this team. Yeah. We, we talked to him after the game and he, you know, he was asked about like basically his play since the deadline and, and now being a week past that. And he said like, well, I've been through it before, but also like, yeah, of course you, you feel, you just feel better, more comfortable once you get past that and you know, okay, this is where I am at least the rest of the season. Like, obviously there's still questions about his next contract and free agency and where all that ends up, but he knows he's here through the end of this season. So I do think, you know, I think he was starting to pick it up even a little bit before the deadline, but even but especially since the deadline you see him kind of playing with a little you know weight off his shoulders and i think you can say the same about linus Elmark, who by the way had a second straight really good outing um post deadline uh, obviously sat against pittsburgh and now thursday in montreal um there's and there's some developments on on goaltending that i want to get into in a little bit but you know we can keep it to our opening shift guys for now yeah cuz scott was was questioning Monty pregame about there's a few reporters around that were like really trying to sniff out the real answer for what they genuinely 
consider a goalie rotation in the playoffs. We'll get to that after we kind of touch on the opening shifts, right, though? Because uh, that's an, another interesting conversation. But I think, Brian, the DeBrusque uh, opening shift is a good one because – it, it, it was a theme, you know, like guys playing a little bit more confidently now that they know they're here, right? Like Allmark playing great. Uh, DeBrusque looking like he's playing more to his ceiling than he had been when he was going through, you know, a drought. Um, and it, he he joked about it after the game. Someone someone asked him first question about like, you know, is, are you do you feel more comfortable now that deadline's passed and you're still here? And he's like, well, I've been through it before. Um, because he has, and, and so he, and, and at the end of the day, both of them are happy that nothing went through, that they're both still here. And, uh, every, and, and Montgomery talked about it after the game too. He was like, in particular, we think those guys are, are very valuable to us. Basically saying like, I don't think what the return would have been would have helped the team. Uh, so it, it was nice. I, it's kind of funny. We, is that the first time we've been able to talk to DeBrusque since the trade deadline? Um, no, he talked. He talked one other time. I think either a morning skate or practice. Because yeah, because he um, it was, it was the it felt like he was all of a sudden realizing like oh yeah crap that's that's right that was that was a week ago and still haven't really talked too much about it. Um, but yeah, and, and he obviously scored the, the game winner. Good setup. Um, I don't know. I was playing good. Yeah, and, and he was hunting pucks last night, too, on the Nesson broadcast after the, uh, I think it was the second period, maybe the first, but uh, Razor and um, Sophia, and I think it was, was it Billy? Um, they were, or maybe it was Barry. I don't, I don't remember. But they were, they were highlighting some of his shifts, um, and he was just hunting pucks. And ultimately, it lead he gets he does get the game winner in a three on three format but yeah it's just I, I just don't think it's any secret i think there's no doubt he's a polarizing player um there's a lot of people that that don't like him because maybe they think he's softer or inconsistent or doesn't score but i th and there's a lot of people that 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 love him and i think that when somebody's polarizing it's because everybody universally has expectations for a player and and yeah, it's just great to see him scoring and 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 playing well. Uh, additionally to that, so they're going to need him. He's definitely an important player. And I don't know if you had any follow up thoughts on on DeBrusque. It's it's just kind of an obvious take, right? But again, when he's scoring, it's 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 worth mentioning down the stretch here. Yeah, and it you know he, he needs to be on top of his game for that. I'm going to call it the first line: him, Coyle, Marsh, and I think really you could probably flip the top two lines, call them whatever you want. Um, but you know, Coyle's been a little quieter offensively recently. I don't think he's been playing poorly. Um, Marshand had a little bit of a slump that he's pulled out of. He's put up some points recently, but yeah, like the Bruins just aren't deep enough in the top six in terms of high end talent to really have anyone in there slumping. Like they kind of need everyone to pretty much be on their game. So, you know, DeBrusque is streaky, but obviously he's, he's hot right now and you hope that carries into the playoffs, you know, that second line that I actually, I like the way Heinen's played with Zach and Pasternak. That's not, you know, you wouldn't look at that normally and be like, Oh, Danton Heinen, you know, yeah, sure. Second line, right. Bruins tried that back in 2019 and it, you know, well him, him and like eight other guys, but no, no one ever clicked there. Um, you know, I'd asked Montgomery about that before yesterday's game, and he said he, he likes the defensive responsibility Heinen brings to that line. He thinks he's helped them win pucks back, but they did need a little more offense. And sure enough, lo and behold, there you go. They scored the game's first goal. Um, Zaka sets up a pass knock one-timer, and then Heinen does a great job getting the rebound and putting it back while getting knocked to the ice. So, you know, there's there's the more offense that they're looking for. That was like a slow mo. <laughs> that was the most slow mo goal ever. He's like falling slowly, just trying to get the stick on it, and he knocked it in. And he's he's been good too. And people were talking about like, okay, maybe it's time to extend Heinen. Like it, he, you you like him? Like you're you only have him for a year right now, so maybe extend him. And he's he's been a great addition as 
I'll call him a walk on because <laughs> uh, he, he, <laughs> he, you know, he was just mm. there on a, on a, on a tryout and then he made the team and he's done well. And he's now he's playing with David Pasternak who saw that coming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that line, that line actually has been playing pretty well. Maybe uh, who knows? Maybe Mark Wahlberg can can play Dan Hine in uh, in Invincible Two Hockey Edition or something like that. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because you, you're right, Scott. Like in theory, you think to yourself, uh, Hine on on that on that line, it, it feels like it's not an optimal line from a talent standpoint. But at the same time, all year we've accepted Zaka and Pasternak and and JVR if they were a combination, and you know at, at, at JVR and Heinen's respective stages in their careers, I wouldn't say one is significantly better than the other necessarily. So why were we okay with JVR? But Heinen, it seems weird. I think it's because historically JVR is a proven scorer in the league um, and has played top six minutes in both Philly and Toronto. But um, like, if you look at their current skill sets, I think Heinen foot speed wise, like keeps up with Zaka and Pashnak's game a little bit better. And, and yeah, there's defensive, um, there's defense defensive efficiencies that that Heinen brings that helps them as well. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you guys about that line, and, and and Scott, you bring it up. Like, I I I again because this team doesn't have a bunch of rock stars on it. They have a couple, right? But like, not enough to have two full two top two lines full of them. My point is the trade deadline's come and gone. We know that they're not going to bring in another top six forward externally. It, it kind of is what it is, and they're going to be a, they're going to be a high end forward short. We already knew that about them. So um, if that's this line and passion acts, all world play can make up for a little bit of high and not being a true bonafide top six score, but he brings other assets to that line. If they keep playing like this, I, I, I don't necessarily want to see a change. I don't know if there's a combination you guys are dying to see other than, than them right now with, with passion No, I think, I think it's working pretty well. Um, really almost almost every line so yeah for once they actually have some consistency um from game to game obviously van reamsdyke was out thursday because he was sick uh so that threw you know a wrench into the lines for thursday night but yeah i think those all four lines have looked pretty good so you might as well ride it like you want to have it, we know things are going to change in the playoffs whether it's in game or game to game but you want to have sort of like a base foundational lineup that all right these changes aren't working let's go back to the thing that like that everyone's comfortable with you, you want to at least have that even if you make switches to get away from it and it feels like this lineup that they've had now for several games of Marshan Coyle DeBrusque, Heinen Zaka Pasternak, Van Riemsdyk, Geeky Frederick and then I know we're going to get more into the fourth line to build off Bridges opening shift, but really any combination they've had there has done pretty well recently with Bogvis, Brizzo, Lauco, Beecher jumping in with a good game. Um, so it feels like that's going to be, you know, that's the safety net. Like this is the lineup that I think Montgomery will come back to when, you know, we'll probably start the playoffs with. And then even if there's changes, you can come back to this as sort of everyone's comfort zone. Yeah. I think this has become like an, the obvious lineup, like you said, besides the like JVR probably factors in back on the third line. Bre Brezzo was elevated for the Montreal game because JVR was out. Um, but so did you want to go to what, what I said, like the, the the optimal fourth line? Because it's interesting. We were having this conversation at the bar last night. Like, where does Maroon fit in? Like, does like where does Pat Maroon like who do you take out? um for a pat maroon fourth spot um basically where does he slot in also we can kind of give our latest update on whether or not like he'll he'll be ready in time for the playoffs um because there's some troubling signs about his health that have that have come up i think scott you might have mentioned this last episode as well but um he did not travel to montreal he has not been skating either so um we can talk about, you know, who you'd want to see on the fourth line, if it includes him or not. Uh, so, so I don't know who wants to start with their, their thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll just give my two cents quickly. I, I think that I do think that if Maroon was healthy and, and 
playing at a at a reasonable level, I do think that he would be in the lineup game one of the playoffs, despite not having uh, a ton of games with the team. Um, I think that when you have three Stanley Cups to your name in recent years, and you are capable of scoring at the NHL level, along with not allowing anybody to bully or take advantage of your superstars, you're going to put that guy in a lineup. He he gets the benefit of the, of the doubt if he's healthy. Um, whether or not one agrees with me on that, that's totally subjective and fine. But I, I do think if you're if you're the Bruins and you're and you're Jim Montgomery, especially if you're playing, you know, Toronto in the first round with Ryan Reeves and others running around, or Florida at some point in the second round, or Carolina, like you're gonna. I just think that they're gonna want him in that lineup if he can stay healthy and can can prove to not be a detriment in uh, in between the, the the boards. And I think maybe the casualty is Loco on the left side, um, or they just kind of rotate guys in though to make sure Maroon stays in, or if Maroon's not playing great, they just kind of rotate everybody. But I do think if Maroon comes back at some point before the regular season ends, plays a couple games and looks, you know, decent enough, I do think that they'll give him the benefit of the doubt in game one. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because Bruins got him and the timeline, you know, based on reports was two to three weeks, you know, probably by the end of March. Well, obviously, some I don't know if there was a setback or maybe just the Bruins evaluated the situation differently. But he he was skating. Now he's not. That like that's not especially encouraging. So now you wonder. You know, there hasn't been any sort of update. No one's saying anything. But you wonder, like, has that timeline changed? And you know, is his return now looking at some point in April? Because you are going to want to get him into games. You know. I, He's been around. I'm I'm not really worried about him adjusting to systems or anything. He's probably played just about every system there is. Um, but, you know, chemistry with line mates and just to see how he looks. Um, you know, back surgery is not nothing. Not when you're in your mid 30s. Like that's you're you're going to have to see it first. So, um, yeah, and it, and it and it's tough because, again, everyone else has been playing well, like Bogfist playing well. Lauko's had, you know, went a kind of a long stretch where he was the odd man out, but I think he's had good jumps since he came back in. I think Brazo is still playing well. Um, when he's on the fourth line, I didn't think he, I just, I thought that third line in general last night kind of had a tough game. They're, they're very quiet and, um, you know, not all his fault, but they, there wasn't really much there that where you were like, oh, wow, he can play in the third line too. Like, now he's probably playing on the fourth line or not playing. Um, and then beat like you love if Beecher plays like that, like he did on Thursday night, it's hard to keep him out too, because what he brings on faceoffs is so valuable for a team that's struggled on faceoffs. I mean, for him to come right back in first game in a you know a couple months and win eight out of eleven, like yeah, Bridget, you mentioned, you know, Montgomery throwing him out there, key situations late, and it's like yeah, well, like, what have we been talking about with this team about how they can't win faceoffs in you know key situations late? And then that's game. why they don't close out games. And and then yeah. you bring him in and he's winning key faceoffs. And I know it wasn't directly in the line in this line of play, but like then they close out the game, they win in overtime. So, um, yeah, it, it, it could be a missing piece. Like it, it really could. And as long as he's looking like he's made some improvements since two months ago when when they sent him down to Providence, he's a good option to have there. And, and obviously he's hoping he sticks and, and he, he can stay and, and carve out the role that he started the season with. Um, so I see that, that honestly, like if, if we're, if we're being real about it, it's probably going to be a rotating fourth line from now until probably through the playoffs because each each guy brings something a little bit different. Maybe it's matchup dependent. Maybe it's this guy had a bad game. We get someone else in. This guy has had a good game. We're going to keep him where he is, you know, just completely based off of their own performances at the time. Um, but Beach is a good piece to have. Uh, if, if you're seeing that faceoffs are, you know, biting you, or if you want to get ahead of it and you're like, no, we're, we're going to start with him as our fourth line center because we, 
we trust him more uh, in these key roles uh, for faceoffs. But uh, my opinion about Pat Maroon and where he would fit would would be first uh, if he's healthy, obviously, um, fully healthy, because you can't you can't have like a eighty percent healthy Pat Maroon. It might cut, turn around and to to bite you. Um, because he's already not the fastest and, uh, you know, if, if he's even slower because of the back issue and also you don't want him to, to have any sort of tweak re-injury if he's not fully ready to go. But I think I agree with you, Brian Blauco seems like the one that he might factor in for. I know people probably would say Brazo, uh, but Brazo is, has been playing his role really well, um, and is it a little bit different skill set than Maroon? Like, if we're looking at like more redundancy, like who is more similar? I feel like maybe Lauko is much faster, but Maroon and Lauko would probably be more of a comp than Brazo and Maroon. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I think it would be Maroon and Brazo. I think they'd be the two that are more similar. And I would like I've mentioned it before, but. I would also question the foot speed of a line with Maroon and Brezzo as the two wings. Yeah. So that would have to be consideration too. Um, Since I didn't give my ideal line, I guess a combination I would like to see, but I just don't know if they're going to have time is Maroon, Beecher, Boakvist. Like I, I think Boakvist has been playing well, so I want him in. I would like the foot speed of that line. Um, it would mean either Maroon or Bovis flips to to the right wing to to their offside. I, I don't know if Beecher could do that too, but you'd have to figure out like how it lines up. But like that combination would intrigue me. Um, obviously, it's just not something we've seen, and you don't know when you're gonna see it. So, um, yeah, not not that like Brazo deserves to come out of the lineup or anything. I don't I don't think he does, but. I'd probably want a little more foot speed than you'd get from a maroon Brezzo line. Yes, and that's that's a fair point to make. Though I would argue, uh, if if you're matching up against other teams' top lines, I mean, I'm sorry, other teams' bottom lines. Hopefully, it's not as big of a contrast. But I also think there's the positive to that is that's a really heavy line. And if, if you yeah. get down low in the offensive of zone, no one's taking the puck off you. No one's no one's out muscling you in front of the net. So it's it's completely fair to bring up the lack of foot speed, and that that would be a risk and a potential concern. Um, and I think it'd be matchup dependent too. Um, so the, the the combo you just mentioned, Scott, I think is interesting as well. They got options. You wouldn't said. have a chance to see it in the regular season, more than likely, like or maybe no. only for like two games in the regular season, no. like. It seems like because we're we're only a month and a day away from the Bruins' last regular season game, um, which is April sixteenth. So, I uh, not a lot of time uh, when Maroon gets back, if he gets back before the playoffs, cool. to, to plug him in and see what works best. Like you're just gonna kind of have to find out on the fly. Um, yeah, you know, I could also see like here's the thing about Loco, and he's played really well, and his foot speed definitely. He, he closes in on, on on opponents on the back check with back pressure. He gets in their face in the four check. That's like, those are all things you love to see. Um, but from an offensive standpoint, he's not, he's just not going to bring you much. And again, let's, we don't want to, I don't want to ignore the, the back surgery to Maroon, but let's just say Maroon was completely healthy. You could see Maroon going into the lineup and scoring two or three goals in like four or five games just because he's he's he he can score at the NHL level and he can he can get dirty like loco you, you can't even see him doing that and I also think that there's there's defensive um weaknesses with loco he's a bit of a riverboat gambler at times is that something that Jack likes to say um where he just sometimes he's he's too fast for his own good he's too he's too much of an ankle biter for his own good. Sometimes he gets caught running around. And while I love the energy and the effort, sometimes that can lead to, you know, breakdowns in coverage and whatnot. And I just think that if you have a fourth line with you know, Maroon and, and Boquist and Brazo or Maroon and Beecher and Brazo or whatever, maybe the combination Scott said, I just think it limits potential risk defensively. 
Yeah. It, I don't know if you guys had any other thoughts, but I was going to maybe transition to peak in the defense and see if you guys have any evolving opinions about how maybe what like the best defensive lineup is. Cause we've, you know, we've seen a few different combinations. We saw, um, you know, Shat and Kirk get rotated out. Obviously Grizzly was sick. So he missed Thursday's game. So you got Lori moving up to play with McAvoy. Um, Wotherspoon comes back in peak makes his debut. So again, another place where it's like, Hey, it's great to have all these options. But at some point, they are going to have to, you know, figure out exactly what their best six looks like. Well, I think Watherspoon is going to take home a Norris in the next couple of years. That's just my opinion. But um, I don't. I'm just kidding. I don't want people to take me too seriously there. But I don't want him coming out of the lineup. I, 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 I thought he was great last night in Montreal, and I think he's been a really good player since they called him up. Honestly, and I that third pair of Watherspoon and and Peak, I just think. That kind of not that Shattenkirk can't be doing the same thing out there because he's a he's a good veteran, but Peak and Watherspoon they do exactly what you want a third pair to do, and that's make their opponents earn every inch of ice, be strong in front of their net, um, physical, and I like I think I think Peak plays such a simple game. I don't think it's going to be difficult for him to come to a new system, a more structured system, and kind of flourish. I, I'm not really worried about a defensive minded big body defenseman not being able to do those things um i i really do think being in columbus and i know compared to his other columbus teammates his analytics were not great i just think that it was a bad situation for him uh and i i don't know about you guys but i really like watherspoon on that third d pair so you know if like i want i don't want him leaving so if peak has to rotate out with shattenkirk or whatever that's 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 fine, but I don't want Watherspoon leaving that third D pair. And as far as the top four, I think I mentioned it last episode. I just think Lori plays a lot better when he's playing with like-minded, like like skill setted individuals like McAvoy or, or anybody in that top four. Um, I think he needs to be in the top four to really get the best out of him. Whether or not he's ready for that role or not, I don't know, but I think you get the best out of him when he's in that role. Yeah, I it was funny. We got a chance to talk to Peak before the game. And you could just see how refreshed he was, like how happy he was for the change of scenery. Uh, Just you get got that whole vibe about him. Like I'm actually somewhere I can play. I can't because he wasn't getting a lot of ice time. Um, And now, you know, now he's hoping him and Wotherspoon can can be a, a reliable pair that you use a lot. And I I think that the small sample size, just the one game so far was very promising that that could be a, a very useful pair. I think Shattenkirk hadn't been playing well. Um, so I, I thought, and, and we at the end of last podcast said probably time to switch out both, like switch the bottom pair up completely because Wotherspoon was also out the previous game and came back in. Um, and it just seems like it could, it could be a good fit. I mean, it's obviously a better fit for him. His, he, wasn't getting the playing time he wanted or pro- thought he deserved in Columbus. So, uh, and they, so I noticed the first penalty kill, they didn't have him out on the ice at all, but then they started working him in uh, as they took more penalties. Uh, he was starting to get more time on the penalty kill. Cause, cause that's what we're talking about with replacing Forbert. Like we're talking about, all right, this guy might come in and be able to, to do some of the same things Derek Forbert could do. Well, then that means he would need to be getting, some serious min- minutes on the PK and be solid um, as a penalty killer. So that we haven't really seen uh, fully yet because they, I think they were a little bit conservative with using him on the PK against Montreal. Yeah. He only had, he only had 45 seconds there. And that might be that, you know, he might just not have had a chance to practice their PK yet. Like he, he had one full team practice on Wednesday, um, which, uh, you know, actually we weren't at cause we were driving up that day. But I know they do power play work every practice, but, you know, exactly how my power play and penalty kill work, obviously they go against each other. Um, but like exactly how much we don't really know, you know, it's like how much were you able to get him up to speed there in, in one practice? So I would anticipate getting him. They'll get him more time there um, going forward, but yeah, it, Brian, I think I think you're right about Laura. Like either he's, it, it's it's him versus Grizzly, right? Like it, it feels like it's those two 
essentially battling to be Charlie McAvoy's D partner game one, because I don't, I also don't love Laura in a third pairing role. Um, you know, maybe it's because when he's been there, he's usually been with Chad and Kirk. And I've kind of thought for a while, like those two haven't just haven't really clicked. Like they don't seem to work super well together. Um, I, you know, maybe he'd work better with peak if they ever gave that a look. Um, but then, like you said, like that, that means Wetherspoon comes out and I, I don't really want that. Um, I, I, I like the idea of the Wetherspoon peak third pairing. Like if, if they continue to play the way they did Thursday night, that's, that's solid. Like that's, you can absolutely win with that third pairing. Um, Lindholm Carlo, you feel good about, we, we haven't, well, we can, I'll save him as Lindholm for when we do ups and downs, but, um, but yeah, it, you know, before Grizzly got sick, I thought, I thought he had played a few really solid games. There were, especially against Toronto and Pittsburgh, that Grizzly McAvoy pairing had, some of those like classic Grizzly McAvoy games where you look and it's like 70% Corsi and the Bruins have badly outshot the opponent when they were on the ice. And it's like, all right, like they can still do that. Um, and if they do continue, continue to do that, then it's hard not to start the playoffs with that and see where things go. Um, Laura definitely has more upside than Grizzly. It's just a matter of like whether his all around game is going to be in a place to beat him out for game one right now. But I do, I do think even if Laura doesn't start the playoffs in the lineup, it's like one slip up from someone, especially from Grizz, like probably gets him in. Yeah. Cause that seems like his most natural fit has been with McAvoy. Um, him and Shattenkirk. I, I, agree. I would say maybe, maybe with Carl, with Carlo, like I, I think he's looked really good with Carlo, but you're not, splitting up Lindholm Carlo, that's your, your shutdown pair. No, it, it, it's just, it just doesn't really work when it's him with someone else who is a little bit shaky and Chad Kirk has been a little bit shaky, right? And Wotherspoon maybe doesn't have the skill set to pick up when, when Laura makes a mistake. You know what I mean? Like the way that McAvoy can cover flaws. Um, so I guess the real question is, like, is would you rather have Grizzly or Lori in the lineup? And that's something that that's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it right now if you don't want to. Um, it, but it's something that they're going to have to figure out in the playoffs. And I feel like my gut tells me that they're still going to stick with Grizzly. Um, what would you or, prefer, or, though? I, I am curious what your answer to that question is. Mine's Lori. I'll just I'll just say it. Yeah. I, I want Lori right now over Grizzly. That's just me. And I, can give, I, I can list off my reasons, but I don't want to take up too much time. But it's Grizzly. It's it's, uh, it's Lori for me. Personally, I think at this point in time, it would be Grizzly that would be more like you go with him because he's got more experience in the play. Like just specifically because of the situation, like he's been in it before Laura has it. Um, that might feel like a safer move to keep Grizzly there. I, I would probably start with Grizzly there. Um, but it would, it would be a short leash for me. Um, you know, I, like Laura is a good option. So I wouldn't, it, we've seen Grizzly struggle in the playoffs before. If that happens again, like I, I wouldn't just keep playing him and let him play through it. I'd, I'd go to Laura. But the reason I would start with Grizzly is because Bridget, you mentioned, you know, McAvoy can help cover for Lori. Well, if he's playing that way where it's, you know, okay, I have to be aware of, you know, if Lori takes a chance or whatever, I think McAvoy might not play as free offensively. And I, I do think Grizzly allows McAvoy to do that. Like Grizzly, those two know each other's game so well that, you know, I think McAvoy can get more involved offensively, take more chances because he trusts Grizzly to cover for him, um, you know, not just the other way around. So that that would be my reasoning for starting there. And like I said, I think Grizzly had been playing well, which I don't want to overlook. We know he's had an inconsistent season overall, but I do think he's been better recently. Yeah, all, all fair points. I would I would I would go the opposite. 
I would start with Lorai and give him that same short leash that you would give Grizzly if he didn't play well to start. I would give Lorai the opportunity. I think, I think that whether people want to acknowledge it or not, I do think that uh, coaches, uh, GMs, I do think they prefer to have a little bit more size and reach on the back end. And I think that Lorai, to no fault of Grizzlicks, he he's he's a bigger player, but he's also a very gifted skater and and playmaker and you know i think about potentially who they could be playing in the first round if it's toronto i think i think lorai's played really well against toronto this year it was his first nhl game i think was against toronto potentially um so i i just i I think about can austin does austin matthews you know skate down the ice looking at grizzly and think to himself i mean i think i can take advantage of this player or does he look at uh, Lorai's size and skating ability, and, and think it's a little bit tougher to get to inside ice with on a on, on Lorai or get to the net on Lorai. So again, I, I, I see the positives with Grizzly. He has been playing well. He has experience, and he does make Charlie McAvoy feel very comfortable out there, which is good because McAvoy is one of your best players. I also don't think it hurts for McAvoy to kind of feel like he has to step up a little bit more um, and and maybe be a little uncomfortable. So. Yeah, I think either way, it's a good option. Again, we're talking about two really good players, I think. But I would start with Lorai. And if he shows he really just can't handle the moment, okay. Well, here comes Matt Grizzlick. So I would I would start aggressive and then lean back on my safety plan as opposed to the opposite. Um, I don't know if you guys need follow-ups on that. Scott, I did want to get to your your, your question with Jim Montgomery uh, pregame last night in Montreal. That's I I, I was going to tweet something about it, but I figured I'd w- wait for the podcast. And I will let you uh, discuss in detail what was asked and what was said, and then I'll give my thoughts on it. Yeah, so we don't know what the Bruins are going to do with their goalies. Um, they continue to kind of dance around it, whether that's because – publicly they just don't want to give anything away which would be understandable or because maybe they just legitimately don't know but i do think i got jim montgomery to pretty much rule out one thing and that is doing exactly what they did last year which was for people who might not remember how people remember how the playoffs ended obviously but down the stretch in the regular season they kept the rotation going right to the end it was all mark swayman all mark swayman right to the final game of the regular season. And then they tried to ride all Mark for the first round. Um, I basically, I asked Mont- Montgomery directly, like, could you do that? If you keep the rotation going to the end of the regular season, could you then ride one goalie? Um, and here was his quote. So he kind of mentioned like, well, you might go two games in a row with one goalie. It might not be a strict rotation. Um, but then he said, but that's something we're going to have to discuss internally. And we know if you go with a platoon the whole year, switching in and out, you can't expect one guy to ride the emotions of the playoffs by themselves. That to me was about as close as we've gotten to one particular plan being ruled out. So I would say if they keep the rotation going till the end of the regular season, expect them to use both goalies in the playoffs, whether it's, a strict rotation or, you know, someone gets two or three starts in a row, but probably not much more than that. Um, And then the flip side of that is if they are thinking about riding one guy, and I think we feel like maybe Swayman has the edge, um, I would expect them to end the rotation soon and give someone, you know, three, four, five straight starts in the regular season to start getting them ready for that. So, you know, that, 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 Four and a half, five hour drive up to Montreal with a couple of breweries in between was good for something, Scott, because I think this is a very interesting talking point that if Boston media is smart, <laughs> they'll take it and run with it. It's because it's been a polarizing topic for a couple of years and you got a really good answer uh, and a very transparent answer. And here's what I'll say. I, I've been on record the entire time that I, I don't I never love the idea of quite literally rotating goalies one game, one game in the playoffs. And a counter argument to that would be, well, they went with the rotation all year, so go with what got them there. And and that's a point that I I couldn't really argue because you're right. That is what 
they did the whole time and it doesn't set up the goalies favorably to now just take the load in the playoffs. But I also didn't agree with necessarily that strategy either, but I, I got the point. How can you rotate all year and then give the net to one guy because they're not used to it? Because people would say you can't give them the net because they're only both of them are only an elite because of this rotation that they're doing. We haven't seen them take one guy take the net. And I understood that. I didn't agree with that philosophy because I wanted one guy to take the net for the most part, but I, I agreed with it. I understood it. And and J Jim Montgomery is saying just that. And and what I took from that is that they're gonna go. They're going to go with one guy. And if one guy struggles, they won't take very long to go to the next guy. Yeah, but we Ronald thought the last playoffs and they, they it seemed like they waited too long. Last, to play la last playoffs, there was a lot going on. Um, like there was a lot going on. You had so many injuries. Allmark was injured. Allmark wasn't. I, 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 I don't, as far as last year goes, like, I can't really my, my 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 brain's numb thinking about that collapse last year and and honestly we cannot blame necessarily the the goaltending lack of rotation because uh, for not winning the first round because before Allmark had a chance with the puck on his stick in game 5 to fuck it up Brad Marchand had a breakaway with a second left of regulation that could have ended everything and we wouldn't be talking about this but there's there's a lot of meat on that bone, so I'll just keep it to this year. I'll, what I'll say what I'll say is this: I, reading between the lines, I don't think the Bruins want a situation. I, I, I don't think they're going to rotate this year because at the end of this year, because I don't think they're going to do it in the playoffs. If they're going to stop the rotation, then they're not going to do it in the playoffs. To Scott, to your point, and I think that was very telling that Monty even said that because months ago he said the opposite, and I think. I just think that there's a lot of mental games that goes on in the playoffs. Like the, the, people say people in favor of the goalie rotation and, and Scott, I know you've said on record, like I'm not saying to go every other game. Um, but if there's a situation in the playoffs where goalie a uh, loses game one, goalie B wins game two, you like you, you're at game three and you're already at a pickle. Do you go back to the guy who won, who lost game one, or do you stick with the guy? And and that's why it's just it causes so much um, confusion. I think in the room, it I just it's it becomes a distraction to me. So uh, I don't so, know yeah. if it does though. Just like in terms of they trust, like these guys trust both goalies. Like the guys play out in front of them, like they're they're trusting either of them to go in. Um, and it also becomes an, a difficult decision. All right. You have to, if you have to choose now, after Omar Omar had two great games, but Swayman has been probably more like more consistently um, the better goalie throughout the season. But they're so close; it's hard to tell. If if you have to make that decision now, and one guy doesn't get you like doesn't get used as much, starts sitting because you're trying to get somebody emotionally ready for the playoffs and give them more of a workload to to get uh, just to prepare for it. Now what do you do when when with the other guy like it? I think he just the rest of the season and, or majority of the rest of the season and like then if you need to use him in the playoffs, how is that going to go? Look, I, I think I think you have fourteen games left. Okay, uh, I think you just I think you give Swayman maybe you give if you if if the Bruins think right now that based on the 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 the, the sample of the entire season so far that they like Swayman, whether it's his gamesmanship or whatever. If there's 14 games left instead of going seven and seven, you know, go, go 10 and four or nine and five. I don't know, but like it, you got to pick a guy. I'm telling you right now, it's going to backfire. There's, there's going to be so much second guessing if they just go into a 50, 50 playoff thing. I, I, I don't see it. I think Scott said it best recently. Like, whatever goalie is playing best heading into the playoffs, you play him in the playoffs until he has a bad game or two, and then go to the other guy because you know you have two great goalies. Well, again, but my point is, like all along has been, there's going to be second, when you have two really good goalies, there's going to be second guessing no matter what. And basically, unless you win it all, like unless the strategy you pick works out perfectly, there's going to be second guessing. They Last year, they tried to ride the Vezina Trophy winner, and there was a ton of second guessing. Like, at multiple points during that series. So 
you know, just picking a guy and like going with them, that doesn't that doesn't preclude the second guessing. Like that's still gonna be there if if it doesn't work, right. because then you get you get the same questions as last year of like, well, then when do you make the switch? Is it one bad game? Is it two? What if he has a good game, an okay game, a good game, an okay game? Like that it, there's gonna be there's second guessing pretty much no matter what, unless the the option you pick just like works almost to perfection but it's it's there's it's so much more manageable to second guess like a decision or two than it is to second guess constantly every series like you could potentially play what, what 28 games in the playoffs like to to be to every series be like should they have gone with swimming in this game or all oh, that's guys my my brain would explode having to talk about this like just well, like, it seriously would the real I, issue I, I, is I really that, think we're I really think like we're gonna be doing that anyways though. Like that's just yeah. a product of having two high end goalies. Yeah. Well one, and, and the yeah. real issue is that I think that there's there's two people involved in making the goalie decisions and they might not agree either. <laughs> so like goalie Bob is somebody that they trust to make those decisions. Montgomery might have a different opinion of what they should do, who they should play, and you know, they I they might butt heads about that. And last year it did kind of sound like he threw goalie Bob under the bus a little bit. <laughs> so I feel like they might not see eye to eye on what they should do necessarily. I, um, yeah. And that could complicate things too. But what, what makes me, what makes me nervous about, about constantly switching up goals in the postseason because don't, I, I completely understand like the argument keep them fresh. They're both really good. Like they're used to it. Like it's, it's not going to disrupt their rhythm or whatever, but I have a hard time. Like goalies are such a interesting creature. Like if, if Swayman goes out there or Olmark, if one of them goes out there and has like a 50 plus save performance and he's just feeling good about himself, um, and Scott, I know this is not what you were saying. You, in your world, you would stick with that guy at the following game, but a lot of people are saying, like, no, no, rotate him. And I, I can't get on board with that because if a goalie gets hot, he gets hot, and you can't get hot if you're literally, you know, every couple games sitting on the bench. I just, I don't love it. One thing I just want to, I just want to clarify is last Bridget, you brought up last year. Um, I thought Olmark was. He, he, he had a crucial mistake in game five in overtime along with Matt Grizzlick. Um, And he was not great in game six, obviously. But I don't want to make the mistake of letting the team off the hook because they were up three to one and goaltending, their, their team defense was terrible <laughs> in the back half of that series. It was, but, you know, Almar Goss had a, kind of a subpar pretty rough game too. And that, you know, like I, I remember after that, I think I would have, I think I said I would have started swimming game three just because like I, I wanted, you know, to use both. Um, I was, I was pro rotation and it and still would be if, if it, if they are both playing well down the stretch this season, I would still be in favor of it. Um, but, for the record, I wanted Swayman game f- game six too last year. Just so I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, that's I'm, the easiest second guess was not making yeah. the switch after. But but game it goes five. to show that it goes to show that like I'm not I'm also not just like one guy only. Like like I was willing last year to give it to Swayman. I wanted Swayman in game six and seven because game seven alone is that's a tough ask. So yeah. I, I I'm I'm more in the middle ground than I probably sound sometimes. But I don't mean to derail you. Yeah, but you know, but again, then like Allmark had good game three, good game four, and it's like, well, you can't switch then. So, um, yeah, but one one thing I wanted to highlight though, just the Bruins' schedule the rest of the way is a little bit funky. Like, there's a couple back to backs. There's a couple long three, even four day break at one point. Like, and I don't think either of those are really conducive to riding a guy. Like, you don't really have back to backs in the playoffs. They don't like playing goalies back-to-back nights anyways. Um, if you have two days off between games, that doesn't really mimic playoffs. So I would highlight two stretches of, all right, if you're going to give someone three games in a row, here's where you do it. And one of them is next week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. 
Tuesday, Ottawa, Thursday, Rangers, Saturday at Philly. Like there's a three game stretch that mimics a playoff schedule. You know, not talking about the opponents, but just every other night. Actually, Saturday is even an afternoon game, which, by the way, you get some of those in the playoffs. So um, that would be one of them. And then first week of March at Nashville, Tuesday, at Carolina, Thursday versus Florida, Saturday afternoon in Boston. Like those are the two stretches I would look at and be like, all right, if someone's getting three straight starts and you want to and you're doing that as playoff prep, those are the two stretches where it makes sense. So very interested to see if they do that next week. I got to say, like, my gut still tells me that they're not going to break the rotation just yet, but we'll see. I mean, they've said they might, so, but, you know, at, if they don't do it next week, then I think you kind of only have one other opportunity to mimic a playoff-type schedule. Mm. So, uh, Ryan, you muted yourself. But... Yeah, you muted yourself. Well, um do That's you want to get? <laughs> do you want to get to the who's up, who's down, real quick? We've, yeah. we've gone yeah. long, but that's, we'll... that's, <laughs> that's what I was saying to to myself. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've already touched on some of them. Like, like all, all marks up. That's two really good games since the deadline. Um, Pavel Zak has been putting up points. Jake DeBrus, we touched on. Um, I wanted to highlight Hampus Lindholm. You know, I don't know if you guys had wanted to specifically highlight any of those others, but I think campus Lindholm has played really well since he's come back to the lineup from injury Um, on Thursday. He makes a great play in overtime to win the puck back and start that rush that ends up uh, that ends with DeBrusque's game winner. Um, You know, he won a one-on-one battle down low in the defensive zone to get that going. And I just think he's, I just think he's played really solid and, um, you know, especially that first game back against, I think that was Pittsburgh, right? He, like he had a ton of jump, maybe a little quieter second game, but then I thought really solid again, Thursday in Montreal. Yeah, I think he's up. I think he, you noticed that you, you missed Lindholm. Uh, and we, we talked about how Allmark was, uh, has been up since the trade deadline, um, there is there have been a few that are, are down like JVR we were saying he's sick um that's why he missed the Montreal game and I don't know how long he's been dealing with it but he didn't like his last stretch of a few games he he wasn't very productive um was kind of not noticeable out there uh so yeah, he's got you know, he's got one point in his last 12 games yeah so it, he wasn't making a huge impact and and uh he's maybe it was because he was sick. Maybe, you know, we don't know exactly what he was dealing with, but he he needs to reach, you know, what he was doing earlier in the season when when he was, you know, impactful on the power play um, in front of the net and when he was uh, making things happen on the third line. And, and, you know, is it chemistry? Is it what is it like that he's not seeing right now? I mean, Frederick and him and Geeky have played together quite a bit, so feel like that like chemistry shouldn't be an issue at this point, but maybe that's, you know, maybe that's not a great fit for him for whatever reason. Um, or maybe he's just having a tough stretch here and he'll come out of it, but uh, he's definitely been a down and I don't need to pick on him because he's sick or anything like that. And he's also about to have his 1000 game ceremony. Uh, he already played in his 1000 game, but he's going to have the ceremony Saturday. So. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Trent Frederick is another player who has been just a little bit down. I, I I don't think he's playing poorly, but I think he has maybe six points since the all-star break, which is dating back about a month at this point. Um, again, this is not a crazy down. Just he's somebody who pre all-star break was kind of scoring on a career high clip and was feeling really confident offensively. And he had a really, really great goal against Toronto recently where he stripped William Nylander of the puck and went down and scored a goal to put Bruins up to nothing, but um, just seems like his production has been down a little bit. So he's, he's going to be noted here. And, and, and Scott, you mentioned Charlie McAvoy also kind of pointless in his last six games, maybe, but outside of that, how has he been playing? Do you think? Yeah, I think I would put both Charlie's in kind of the same category where like, I don't think they're playing poorly at all. I think they're, they're still playing well, but McAvoy zero points last six games, 
Coil one point in the last five. Um, so just offensively, they're they're down. Like obviously you need more production than that from those two guys, but I don't think like their whole game has fallen off anything. I think they've mostly still been playing pretty well. And I, I think Zaka has been an up. We talked a little yeah. bit about him, but he was last week he was the second star of the week in the NHL. Like he's been he's been scoring. Uh, he's and that line that we talked about, Heinen and Zaka Pasta, has been has been a good line. It's been a productive line. Heinen, you could also say, is an up. Um, so I think Zaka came to mind right away when we were talking, as well as DeBras, um, for who is out this week. All right, so that probably wraps up for for this episode. I do want to mention quickly the uh, the Bruins play the Flyers. I think in Boston uh, on the sixteenth, which. That reminds me of being, uh, I think it was a 2007, 2008 season, the year the Bruins made the playoffs for the first time in a couple of years. It was the first year under Claude. The Bruins played the Flyers in Boston on a, I think it was a St. Patrick's Day uh, matinee, because I remember there were all green uh, hats in the audience. And it was it was a game where I think Aaron Ward scored like a, a goal in overtime. And it was just, I remember the game because it was one of the first times in a couple of years that the garden was sold out and it was kind of leading into that playoff run. And it's the garden was sold out because people were catching wind that the Bruins were about to make the playoffs potentially. And um, it was kind of the start of the, of the last, you know, almost 20 years of, of, of this Bruins run. And I don't know if you remember, you remember that, but it was against the flyers. So seeing the flyers in town on St. Patrick's day weekend is kind of reminding me of that, of that game. I do. I, like vaguely remember that I, I don't remember all the details um like like you probably do but i do know what you're talking about um yeah philly philly feels like a good saint patrick's day opponent too like you know another another team another city with a lot of uh irish heritage um i'm i'm a little bummed it didn't line up that you know bruins were up here in montreal through the whole weekend um because montreal also goes hard in saint patrick's day it's it's a big deal up here. I know, you know, people think of it as French Canadian, which obviously it is, but there are a lot of Irish up here and there's a lot of Irish bars and pubs. So um, I think it, we, we had a good time Wednesday and Thursday, but I think people are going to be having a really good time uh, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Maybe it's for the best that we're not here for St. Patrick's day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it would be crowded and Scott would be, you know, we don't know. We, I, I don't want to have to scrape. Mr. McLaughlin off the bar floor somewhere. And I know I promised to, to post on the skate pod Twitter account, all of the updates of what we were doing, but then I decided probably posting a bunch of pictures of us drinking is a great idea to put on the work account, <laughs> but I took the pictures. I have the pictures. Hmm. I just, uh, I was like, too yeah, many maybe beer towers, maybe beer towers shouldn't go on our work Twitter, but you know, it's like it's like the opening to the or the end the end credits to the hangover or something like that. It's just all these yeah, crazy, yeah, this crazy night in the town. The end, yeah. <laughs> Where all the pictures come back. Yeah, that's a good idea. If I had more time, I would edit them right into this section right here. And then and then so you guys will be on Sunday actually St. Patrick's Day, you'll be on Sunday skate in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Yep. Nine to eleven AM. Don't all go right. too hard on Saturday night. So that you're awake Sunday morning. <laughs> All right. Saturday night. Saturday night's a work night, so I'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, guys, we could probably sign off. So thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful weekend and a fun St. Patrick's Day. And we'll talk to you on Monday. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this Gate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.